Japan has a new prime minister. And this one, although he might look a little bit boring, is probably one of the more interesting characters that we have seen over the last couple of decades, I would uh, actually argue, because he is, especially when it comes to foreign policy, a, a person who's not that easy to put in, in any box. And although on the outside of it, he might look like a hawk because he has been um, talking about wanting to establish an Asian NATO. Um, this discussion and this person has has really more to him. And I want to look at this with you. Um, so we have to go over a couple of uh, documents, especially his own foreign policy speeches and um, also a video by him because this man, and that's also something interesting, has his own YouTube channel. The new Prime Minister of Japan now has a YouTube channel. I am uh, happy though to report that uh, my English language channel has uh, more <laughs> has more subscribers than the current Prime Minister of Japan. But that one aside, he actually does broadcast directly to um, people his ideas. And um, in one of these videos, he also talks um, about his foreign policy ideas um, on the the basics of him to know. His name is Shigeru uh, Ishiba, so Mr. Ishiba is, gonna, is the Prime Minister from now on. He is 67 years old, not the youngest, but also not, not one of the oldest um, people in global politics. I mean, both Joe Biden and uh, Donald Trump are, of course, uh, much older. So he is he's age-wise more or less what you would expect. Japan has a, has a tendency to have rather... Uh, uh, rather older people in their 50s and 60s running for office and he um, was so far not uh, elected in a general uh, general election. Uh, the way this Japanese system works is that if the previous prime minister steps back, which Fumio Kishida did recently, then the governing party has internal has an internal election which is uh, which is what happened there were nine candidates for the for the leadership actually of the party so what you need to know is that the um, japan is governed by for the last 65 years by this party here the liberal democratic party uh, it's really this party has been in power for a long time there were certain breaks one year 1993 when a different party uh, came into power the uh, uh, the basically a, a social democratic party, um, and in 2009 and 2012 too, there was for three years there was another party in power. But more or less continuously, the LDP has been has been the largest force in Japan's politics, and they hold an absolute majority in the lower house, the House of Representatives. Um, they have 258 seats out of the total of 465 which gives them an absolute majority and in 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 the upper house the house of Counts councillors which in the us this would be called the senate um there they also hold a majority not an absolute one only 115 out of 248 so they have been in coalition this party has been in coalition for the past uh for many 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 years actually with a small party the Kometo, which is a um which is a small, rather um, well, religious-leading uh, conservative party. But this is basically, if you want it, if you want an, uh, uh, if you want a comparison to a European country, I would liken the LDP to something like the old uh, CDU of Angela Merkel. I mean, that's that's around the you know the mindset of these people. Although current LDP is very different from current CDU, um, they are still they are still traditionally conservative in my view. Um, the way a lot of Euro, uh, European parties used to be. Now, um, speaking about foreign policy, the, there I would first like to show you this video here that he that he recently published. Um, it's a short one. He had a little a mini series on protecting Japan or pro protecting, and he talks about protecting uh, the Japanese people from various threats, protecting the countryside and protecting Japan, as in external like, protection from external threats. It's a very short video, two, uh, two minutes. Please have a look. I have dedicated my life to national security. We must absolutely protect Japan's peace. The war in Ukraine is not ending. Who predicted that Russia, a permanent member of the UN Security Council, would invade Ukraine? Hardly anyone did. But Ukraine is not part of NATO, so it is not defended. 
This was America's reasoning. Today's Ukraine could be tomorrow's Asia. If we replace Russia with China and Ukraine with Taiwan, there is no NATO in Asia. There is no system of mutual defense obligations. Can we really protect Japan? No matter how many excellent tanks, fighter jets and escort ships we have, what do we do if there are no people to operate them? Currently, only 92% of the self-defense forces positions are filled. Even when we recruit young members, less than half join. Self-defense force members retire at 55. Is there truly suitable work for them afterward? We must provide jobs that match the careers they have built, even if they retire young, across all of Japan. Without properly preparing the security system, international relations, the prime minister, and personnel, how can we protect Japan? As a national security expert, I must say that it is the Liberal Democratic Party that will protect Japan. I want to be at the core of that. Shigeru Ishiba wants to be at the center of the Japanese government, protecting Japan, peace, and each citizen. Shigeru Ishiba will do his utmost to protect Japan. Now, first thing to say, the fact that at the end he used his own name, his name in the third person, that's a normal thing to do in Japanese. And the translation that we did ourselves just, um, just did this uh, pretty much literally. There's nothing weird to that. You listening just to this speech, it could look as if though he is a he's a um, foreign policy hawk, but um, there is he published this a, a longer version of his thoughts in the Hudson Institute recently on September 25th uh, on his vision, and I want to go through this with you. Um, there are several layers to his foreign policy thinking, and some of them are actually quite interesting. Um, let, let's look at them here. I, I kind of highlighted the important parts. Um, this is written by himself in Japanese and then translated. Uh, also, this translation is not an official one. The Hudson Institute says um, original version in, in, in Japanese, right? And uh, uh, somewhere it's written that um, well, there, might be, there might be flaws, but this is more or less fine. Um, Ukraine today is Asia tomorrow. So what we just heard. Replacing Russia with China and Ukraine with Taiwan, the absence of a collective self-defense system like NATO in Asia means that wars are likely to break out because there is no obligation for mutual defense. Under these circumstances, the creation of an Asian version of NATO is essential to deter China by its Western allies. And I know that this sounds like bad analysis from his part, and I think it is bad analysis, but it's undoubtedly... It's, it's without a doubt true that in Japan, general and public perception about the vulnerabilities of Japan um, are similar to, to the vulnerabilities that we've seen in Europe. And people are afraid of um, something happening to Taiwan, like the way what happened to Ukraine, despite, despite, and I know, despite the fact that this is a stupid narrative, but um, these are public perceptions. So he speaks to these public perceptions, right? He also speaks about wanting to reinterpret the Japanese constitution and the status of the self-defense forces, uh, which is also a typical um, LDP talking point that they have been trying to do for a long time, especially on the, uh, the previous, previous, previous um, prime minister, Shinzo Abe, he, who was um, Japan's longest serving prime minister. What you need to know here is that the Japanese constitution, which to a very good part, um, was written by the U.S. occupation forces back in the late 40s and early 50s, uh, late 40s actually, um, by the, the general headquarter of MacArthur, contains a very, very important clause. And I love this clause. It's a wonderful clause. It's the pacifist clause that says under Article 9, famous Article 9 of the Japanese Constitution, Aspiring sincerely to an international peace based on justice and order, the Japanese people forever renounce war as a sovereign right on the nation and the threat or use of force as a means of settling international disputes. This is paragraph one of Article 9, renouncing war as a sovereign right, and paragraph two. In order to accomplish the aim of the preceding paragraph, land, sea and air forces, as well as other war potential, will never be maintained. The right of belligerency of the state will not be recognized. Now, this, this is a very important part of the Japanese constitution, but of course Japan has a military. It has a relatively 
strong and large military, but they don't call it a military. They call it self-defense forces, ground self-defense forces, air self-defense forces, and maritime self-defense forces. So they have everything, uh, uh, an army, a navy, and an air force, of course. So Japan has all of these things. This is how you even get around your own constitution. But, but okay, the point is Japan hasn't used these forces outside of their country in any meaningful way. Japan has dispatched their, uh, their self-defense forces every once in a while to, um, to, to foreign grounds, but they, there is, to my knowledge, no case in which the Japanese actually shot or killed um, people outside of Japan or where Japanese forces were killed by others um, other than during accidents. So Japan actually, over the last 70 years, was ex ex restrained itself very much and has lived up at least to the spirit of this article of using its self-defense forces for self-defense only and nothing else. Now, the LDP ha wanted to, to change this for a while That's um, and they failed. They failed in this. Why did they fail? Because actually the Americans made very sure that it is damn hard to change the Japanese constitution because what you need to do is you need a, a two-thirds majority um, in, um, uh, in parliament and uh, the, the LDP had a two-thirds majority. They, they ruled over more than 66% of these seats uh, in I think in both houses even. Um, but especially with the LDP, uh, with, the, with the Komeito, but um, there's a second catch to changing the constitution, which is that you, after getting 66% approval for a change, you also have a public referendum and mandatory one. So you need to ask the Japanese population, uh, do you agree to the change of the constitution? And it is utterly and completely clear that way more than 50% of the Japanese population are opposed to that idea. Um, this, the, the Japanese um, love actually for Article 9 is so great that the main opposition party um, at the moment even calls itself a party for the protection of the constitution. That's the, the idea. Um, uh, this one, this one here, the the constitutional democrat, the constitutional democratic party. The the reason they chose the word constitutional is because they want to make sure that uh, it's understood that they stand against the revision of the constitution. Um, and this is an uns this was an unsurmountable uh, problem, which even Shinzo Abe, very strong prime minister, very strong backing, uh, in a very strong parliamentary majority, wasn't able to overcome. So they gave that up and what they did in, instead is another one of these dirty tricks. Instead of changing the constitution, they reinterpreted it. Uh, Mr. Abich said from today on, we are going to interpret that the constitution actually allows us to, uh, to deploy forces together with uh, the Americans um, or in conjunction with them. Um, however, it, again, that happened in 2015 and until now, 2024, no huge change actually happened in the way that Japan used its military. So it's still a very restrained military and they didn't go to all-out uh, warmongering or deploying troops to the Middle East or things like that, which the Americans actually would want, <laughs> funnily enough. Um, now, the Japan last year um, changed also part of its security strategy and said that it will try to spend uh, to spend 2% of GDP on its uh, on its military budget to kind of, you know, get closer to these um, NATO uh, standards and work also more with, um, with NATO countries and, and gain the ability to strike with their own missiles at, uh, at adversaries if necessary. I made a video about this earlier, I'll try to link it here somewhere. Um, but basically, still, Japan is restrained at the moment, and 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 is not is not is not trying to project uh, military power so far. So um, we let's continue with the article written by Ishiba. Um, here, he he wants the enactment of a national security leg legislation because he says that the reinterpretation of the constitution and these these. Um, uh, these new approaches at security um, are, and I quote, 
these measures are merely stipulated in cabinet decisions or individual laws. In Japan, it is customary for the Diet to enact basic laws on important issues of national policy, clearly stating the direction of these laws before the people and proceeding with individual policies. However, there is no basic law on security issues to date. And he would like to create a basic law on national security, which spells out the security doctrine of Japan beyond white papers of the government, which is what the current, the current, um, uh, uh, the current strategies are. Uh, and he would still like to revise the constitution and revision of the constitution means revision of Article 9. Although I must stress that even Shinzo Abe never uh, never aspired to change the first part of Article 9. Even Shinzo Abe, the very right-wing conservative leader, only wanted to change Article uh, Paragraph 2. The whole goal was to change Paragraph 2 to say, like, okay, you can maintain regular military forces. That was the goal. Um, because it's sometimes reported that uh, the LDP wants to abolish this, this the, the part one and wants the right to do war that even they didn't do that which is not to say that they're peace loving people but but you know it's not they're not as war mongering as it might seem on the uh, on the outside of it it is then interesting that Ishiba in his article um, talks about the, the changes in the, um, in the international environment he says recently Russia and North Korea have formed the military alliance and I think that's true. I made a video about this before. There is um, very strong indications that the security treaty that Russia and North Korea made are actually more or less a mutual defense treaty. They, uh, at least if the publications of the North Korean uh, state media are correct, then they have a mutual defense clause. And um, Ishiba now is worried that US extended deterrence in the region will no longer function. This is to be supplemented by an Asian version of NATO. His dream of an Asian NATO doesn't come out of the idea of more US power projection around the globe. It comes from a place of insecurity. Ishiba distrusts the ability of the United States to successfully deter uh, China, Russia, and North Korea the way that Japan believed in US deterrence so far. This is quite significant because this, I think, is now driving the rest of his thinking that, in fact, what, it, what Japan needs is what the French would call, um, uh, uh, what's, what's the name, the, the uh, strategic autonomy or, um, in, their, in their military capabilities. So Ishiba in his text says that the Asian version of NATO must also specifically consider American sharing of nuclear weapons on the introduction of nuclear weapons into the region. This is something that also surprises me a lot because, you know, um, the Japan's, the, the general public's adherence to Article 9 is very strong and the general public's um, favor of the three non-nuclear principles are very strong, the three uh, nuclear no's. Um, no production of nuclear weapons, no um, stationing of nuclear weapons, and no transitioning of nuclear weapons. So even, even just transiting uh, uh, nuclear weapons is something that officially um, is still government policy. So uh, he rocks the boat here in both directions in terms of security thinking, um, of distrusting US uh, power projections abil abilities and saying like, well, maybe we do need to think about nuclear weapons, which is something that of course will <laughs> uh, be very worrisome to China, but also to South Korea, um, by the way, because the South Koreans also don't trust the Japanese very much. Um, currently, in addition to the US-Japan alliance, Japan has quasi-alliance quasi relationships with Canada, Australia, Philippines and others. and he, Ishiba, now dreams of molding these different partners of Japan um, into, the, into Asian NATO. If these alliances are upgraded, a hub and spoke system with the Japan-US alliance at its core will be established and in the future it will be possible to develop the alliance into an Asian version of NATO. It's interesting, the hubs and spoke system is a, is a lingo, is, an, is, an, is a way to, to uh, uh, conceptualize the security system in the Pacific, which goes back about 20 years to, um, to the idea of grand strategy. When that came out, uh, there was a lot of 
thinking about how US, the US system was built up and it's a typically American way of framing at the time that you know you have the US in the center and then the US has its folks that go out and then create security or well um, US empire around the globe. And <laughs> Ishiba of course would like to be a hub together with the United States. Now for many of us we will smile at that because we know that the United States mainly wants to use its military allies as tools in order to do power projection. But he's also not completely wrong about this image because it is important that the US-Japan alliance is not it's not structured in the same way as uh, US, the US is, is structured with NATO. It's not an equal um, relationship actually and, and Ishiba talks about this very soon. Um, I'll explain this in a moment because this is important to know. So he then says however on the other hand uh, confidence building measures to reduce potential threats will also be important. So this is why I'm saying he's, he's, he's a multifaceted person and he speaks about um, international cooperation, including with China, um, especially in the realm of disaster management and disaster prevention efforts, right? Um, earthquakes, floods and other um, uh, natural disasters. And he speaks well here of China. China has also been committed to, um, uh, to, to, to disaster prevention efforts, having even dispatched a naval hospital ship to RIMPAC-16. RIMPAC-16, I mean, he has to go back quite far in order to find a good example here, but RIMPAC-16 was a, um, a, a naval um, exercise in the Pacific, one of the biggest ever held, um, with uh, the more than 20 parties uh, uh, um, participating, and the People's Republic of China was one of them. The People's Republic of China, alongside the US and Japan and others, um, practiced um, in, in, in this exercise. And it's 2016, so it's quite a while ago, but it was after the, um, or slightly before, probably planned before um, Obama's pivot to Asia. But still, Ishiba here tries obviously to say that there are, there are um, areas where we can work together. And he has said that in other contexts too, that, okay, on the one hand, deterrence to China is, is one strain, but on the other hand, cooperation and collaboration with China is the other. They do not, Japan does not want, and Ishiba does not want to only rely on deterrence. Confidence building measures are important to them. Um, a, a kind of a dual track approach. And I have heard this before in security experts in Japan speaking about the importance of doing both and of actually also reaching out and, and offering a hand to China in order to manage tensions. So this is not a person who is on board with the idea that um, we just have to uh, militarize the Pacific as much as possible and all will be well and we have the, the Japanese are not on board with the idea of having to have a war with China definitely not now the most one of the most interesting parts is now how Ishiba views the necessity of rekindling the US Japan alliance he wants to strengthen it yes but on equal terms and he wants to um, he strives towards a kind of a relationship that the US and the UK have which to me and to most of you are probably rings alarm bells because we know that the UK is a downstream uh, little dog to the United States and in uh, and very much infused with neocons and the way that the UK recently wanted to use storm shadow missiles against Russia and it was the US that stopped them from uh, apparently so far from doing so is like really really alarming but that's not what he's thinking about and this is an example I think how he Ishiba and a lot of Japanese security thinkers misunderstand the nature of the relationship between the US and various NATO countries at the moment in, in, in Europe. I think they seriously misunderstand that and there's a long history of Japanese um, politicians especially uh, high up ones, misunderstanding the, the nature of what's politically going on in Europe all the way back to the Second World War. And maybe at the end, I can give you an example of that one. But I think this is a misunderstanding. But so I try to inter interpret this as him saying he, he doesn't want to be a dog of the US on the opposite. He actually wants a little bit more to say in terms of like how this, how this relationship works. 
um, he, because he, he officially says he wants the US and Japan to become equal partners. Now, this harks back to the issue that in the when the US security, US Japan Security Alliance was renegotiated in the in 1960, 1959, 1960, Japan struck a grand bargain. The first security treaty goes back to 53, but 53 Japan just became independent again after having been occupied for seven years, right after the Second World War. And then the grand bargain back then and, and in 1960 was the following. The US said, we don't want you to have threatening military capacity again because we don't trust you. Because you, Japan, have been a very bad boy and you, um, you are responsible for the Second World War in Asia. You must agree to not have a strong military. You can never be a threat again. And Japan said, okay, fine, fine. But if we do that, then we want that you protect us. You have to give us a piece of paper that says we will, we will guarantee the prote uh, your, your uh, sovereignty. And the United States said, fine, but in return, we want these bases. We keep these plots of land that we already have our, our people on, our military. We keep these plots of land, including Okinawa, especially Okinawa. And we use this as military bases. So you are going to be our unsinkable aircraft carrier in the Pacific. And Japan said, okay, we'll do this. So the deal, and this is still the deal at the moment, the US provides protection for Japan's sovereignty, legally guaranteed in a treaty. And in the same treaty, it says in return, the US gets to use these military bases in Tokyo and Kyushu and, and especially Okinawa everywhere. And they have these stations of, of, of forces agreement, uh, which also gives the US personnel a lot, a lot of rights in Japan um, of how to, what they can and cannot do, or especially what they can do. And that they are immune of, from the Japanese uh, uh, judiciary and, and uh, you know, if, if a, a, a US servicemen commit crimes, then Japan cannot go after them, etc., etc. And this has been something that has been irking people like Ishiba, and he would like to change this. So he says that the conditions are ripe to reverse, revise, sorry, the conditions are ripe to revise the Japan-US security treaty into a treaty between ordinary, ordinary countries. Um, he, the word ordinary country also carries a lot of weight um, because it, it refers to Japan's um, Article 9 as Japan not having uh, a military, only self-defense forces. So when he says ordinary countries, what he thinks, of, thinks about is like uh, Japan with a normal, normal military, um, the way that other countries have them, and so change of the constitution and and um, reciprocity the way that it is done in NATO. So an Article 5 type of mutual security agreement, but also also equal rights for the Japanese in the United States. Now get this, it's a long art, it's a long paragraph, but let's read this. The current Japan-US security treaty is structured so that the US is obligated to defend Japan and Japan is obligated to provide bases to the US. The time is ripe to change this asymmetrical bilateral treaty. It is possible that the Japan-US security treaty and status of forces agreement could be revised to allow the self-defense forces to be stationed in Guam to strengthen the deterrence capabilities of Japan and the US. Let's pause for a second. He he says um, there should be the Japan self defense forces in Guam, which is a U.S. territory. Um, so he wants he wants Japanese bases in the United States. <laughs> Isn't this interesting? Isn't this interesting? Let's continue. If this happens, a status agreement for the SDF in Guam could be made the same as for the U.S. forces in Japan. What he's talking about here is giving Japanese military the right to not follow US law in the United States. That's the implication. Furthermore, expanding the scope of joint management of US bases in Japan would also reduce the burden on US forces in Japan. This sentence refers to the fact that currently the US is managing its own um, its own military bases alone. The Japanese the, the self-defense forces have no 
part in that and he suggests hey how about we change that we can help you to administer it let our people in let our people be part of the of the admin stuff so he's basically talking about taking back a little bit of sovereignty of these bases to japan and he cushions it he cushions it in this language and saying trying to sell it to the united states saying like hey this could save you a little bit of money he's actually he's actually going that the route of like getting sovereignty back last paragraph it is my mission to raise the Japan-US alliance to the level of the US-UK alliance. To achieve this, Japan must have its own military strategy and become independent in terms of security until it is willing to share its own strategy and tactics on equal terms with the US. As a conservative po politician, Shigeru Ishiba, he could just say I. As a conservative politician, Shigeru Ishiba will build a security system that can protect its own nation by itself and actively contribute to the peace and stability of the Indo-Pacific nations based on the Japan-US alliance. You know, Ishiba here tries to really square a circle. He is actually advocating for strategic autonomy and Japan, the need for Japan to provide security for itself in new structures while cushioning the blow for the United States in in a in common terms and known known references to the US Japan alliance he doesn't say he wants to to abolish the alliance but he wants to rekindle it and he wants to rekindle it toward getting more um, say in what happens with these military assets that the US has in Japan now this is a very very different um talk in a very different way from how NATO in Europe is structured and how US, the US has now established security relationships with uh, Sweden and Finland, in which Sweden and Finland both, and Norway too, by the way, open new military bases and give blanco checks to the US to, to station their forces. Japan is, uh, Ishiba here is proposing the opposite of that. He's proposing to take military sovereignty back and, you know, unsurprisingly, well, Ishiba has been flying under the radar so far. I mean, also I had to, to, to research this, this video here, but uh, we haven't heard a lot of reactions from the US yet. There are some, there are some but there are very clear indications that the US is not happy with this. Um, there is a Reuters article um, from September 27, like four days ago, which talks about Ishiba and where like Reuters asked US um, officials, um, listen to this, what they think about it. Um, the article by Reuters says that Shigeru Ishiba, tapped to be Japan's next prime minister, may cause diplomatic headaches for the US with proposals to revamp Tokyo's closest alliance by locking Washington into an Asian NATO and stationing Japanese troops on US soil. The NATO idea has already been rejected by Washington with Daniel Krittenbrink, the Assistant Secretary of State for East Asia and the Pacific, dismissing it as hasty. Ishiba, however, doubled down on his idea on Friday, telling a press conference that the relative decline of US might made an Asian treaty organization necessary. So they, Reuters picked up on this and Reuters realized that this is um, Ishiba talks about Asian NATO, which sounds very good for the US. And he talks about the US-Japan alliance as something positive, but his ideas are not exactly what, you know, US um, M imperial power projection was about so far. Um, so they, uh, I, I would say that if, uh, Ishiba is only today actually becoming prime minister. I mean, he's currently the, the now the president, the leader of the LDP, and right now, as I speak, he should be confirmed in the um, in the national diet um, uh, in the parliament as the actual prime minister. By the time this uh, video goes online, this will certainly be the case, um, and I this will be interesting. I mean, I don't think that he will be able to pull it off. And, you know, also in, in Japanese media, there are, um, there are reports saying, um, calling him um, idealist. There's this interesting article here that kind of explains where Ishiba's hesitation with the Americans comes from. Uh, the Asahi article here says that the roots of Ishiba's discontent 
traced to a US military helicopter crash on the campus of Okinawa International University in August 2004, when he was serving as the Director General of the Defense Agency, the predecessor of the, De the Ministry of Defense. The US military put the area around the helicopter under a lockdown for about a week after the accident. And then the piece quotes um, Ishiba as saying, Okinawa Prefecture police weren't even allowed to enter the site. All the parts of the helicopter were removed by the US military. Is this, is this nation really a sovereign state? So, and then the Asahi, the Asahi article says that probably he has not enough, uh, Ishiba has not enough um, expertise in foreign relations and in, and in managing uh, the relationship with the US to actually achieve these goals. But I must say, especially when compared to the other person who was running for uh, for president uh, for for uh, excuse me who was um, competing for the well the presidency of the LDP um, Miss uh, Sanae Takaichi um, she she was a typical kind of Abe disciple who who is in favor of a un unquestioned continuation of the US-Japan alliance, Ishiba now that he won this internal LDP contest, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting thing because he is an outsider of the, within the LDP, he is one of the non-conformist voices. And while it is true that um, he is dreaming of, a, of an Asian NATO, I think his version of this is quite different from what the current NATO in the in Europe is. Um, uh, let me see if I can find anything else. I mean, I just looked at the Washington Post, uh, which um, today or yesterday had an article saying that, oh, isn't it problematic that the LDP has been in power for 70 years? It's quite interesting, right? The first time a prime minister uh, comes to power who kind of questions the US-Japan alliance or the, 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 way, the way it works, there are immediately critical articles. Uh, I, probably we will see more of this in the next couple of days, you know, articles critical of, you know, Japan, Japan's democratic backsliding and so on, because this is a prime minister who's actually, who, who seems as if though he's not completely on board with, um, with the way that the, the US power projection is working. Yeah, so uh, I think this is the most important things to watch out for. There's a high chance that Mr. Ishiba actually will not uh, make it very far because Japan also is notorious for um, uh, periods of quick turnover of uh, prime ministers. Uh, Shinzo Abe was in, was in charge six or seven years. That was a very, very long period for, for Japan. Uh, Kishida, um, two, two and a half years. That was actually also quite long. Um, and Mr. Ishiba's first big test is actually going to come in um, October or November. He already announced that he will call a snap election. The Japanese prime minister can do that. He can send parliament home and say, like, we're going to um, vote again, um, a, po a popular election. And if that election then um, strengthens the LDP, then that's going to be his mandate to actually um, to rule with. It could... It could go the other way. I mean, if he, if the LDP loses seats in that snap election, then what will happen um, with absolute certainty is that with the, Mr. Ishiba will step down, um, especially if the, if the LDP loses big. Um, this is not the same thing as, you know, what, what uh, Macron did in France. Macron just had a, a made a charade out of the, uh, out of the popular, out of the uh, general election by basically ignoring what it said, pretending that he cares, but really he didn't. I mean, he didn't. I mean, the, the theater in France is, is crazy at the moment. In Japan, this won't fly. If the LDP loses a lot of seats, Ishiba will be gone because the Japanese system has a, has a history and, 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 and a culture of um, personal, of, of um, politicians taking, taking personal responsibility for electoral defeats. Um, there is no like trickery around. Uh, that's that's uh, pretty much unthinkable. But I mean, he has good chances. Um, he wouldn't call a snap election. He doesn't have to. He's not required to by by the constitution. So this is a voluntary thing because currently the the polling is not bad for the LDP, and he wants a strong mandate. This is a trick that also Abe did several times, and for him the gamble worked out. He he continuously got uh, popular support and then had a strong um, 
a strong actual mandate and, and, and enough seats in parliament to push through the um, the changes that he was that he wanted the the the, the political uh, uh, amendments and so on. And I think Ishiba is, is using the same strategy here. Um, again, whether it will work out or not, we will see. It's it's also possible that in a couple of months we will have another um, LDP internal election of a next leader, and 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 then like <laughs> it's quite likely that we will have a very um, weak um, Japanese weak Japanese cabinets over time. But if the gamble works out, there is a real chance that for the first time we have a Japanese prime minister who really actually wants to assert himself a little bit in this uh, in this strategy. And um, let me just show you the last one. Now I remember why I highlighted this, um, because in, an, in a, a Japan Times article, um, the analyst was looking at the recent book that Ishiba wrote, a um, book called Conservative Politician, My Policies, My Destiny, where he described himself as a conservative liberal. Um, in the mold of Tanzan Ishibashi, a, a short-lived uh, former Japanese prime minister. And that former prime minister was actually in favor of a small Japan, of a Japan that, that did not uh, invade China, which of course eventually they did. I, uh, Tanzan Ishibashi was opposed to that and he didn't want to be a, a large uh, a large power. And um, the, the, the article here says that Ishiba says that this way of thinking is useful in dealing with today's China, arguing for a win-win diplomacy and seeming to advocate for more neutral position, neutrality studies, for a no, more neutral position between Beijing and Washington. This is an interpretation of, an, uh, of, of a Japan watcher. Um, I don't think that Ishiba would uh, 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 would want to go full neutral, but he's probably the closest thing to such a position in the current LDP um, and definitely um, something to watch out for. I think this will be interesting. All will depend on whether or not he gets the popular mandate to continue his policies. Um, on the one hand, he looks like a hawk, but he more behaves like a dove. He's also in favor of, um, of uh, apologizing to Korea and and for the for the crimes, the war crimes committed in China during the Second World War, I this gives me hope that maybe Japan does um, use again a independent foreign policy. I hope one that's not going to be militaristic on the other side, but it's kind of the other side of the coin. If you don't want to rely, as you did until now, on U.S. extended deterrence, you would as a conservative politician, want to build up your own military. Um, we'll see where it goes. Um, thank you very much for listening to this analysis and have a good night.